today, I am very excited to be speaking with Congressman Brett Guthrie of Kentucky's 2nd Congressional District. Representative Guthrie serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Welcome, Representative Guthrie. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me. So with that, let's get right into the questions. My first one. The Congressional App Challenge's mission is to inspire middle and high school students to learn to code and pursue careers in STEM and computer science. So why do you think students should participate in the Congressional App Challenge? Well, I think it's extremely important that, that students learn to code and, and they participate. And this gives them something to shoot for. It gives them goals to reach for. So a lot of people who are interested in coding originally kind of move into this. And, and hopefully, though, as, the, as other students see some of these innovative apps that they can learn to do it as well and learn to code. Um, I've been, I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee, as you said, the telecom subcommittee. And I will tell you, there are, uh, there are large numbers of people with college degrees in coding school today because they can earn so much more money and so much uh, better opportunity. And I, I think everybody should pursue a four-year degree if they can, if it's in their, in their future but also there are other avenues and learning how to code and being innovative in, in the app world that opens a whole world of opportunities. Now, the App Challenge is a bipartisan initiative with support from both Republicans and Democrats. Why do you think members, regardless of their political affiliation, should host app challenges within their districts? Well, uh, young people and learning to code and having a good future is not partisan. Great. And we have students of all coding abilities participating in the challenge. What advice do you have for students who are interested in the challenge? Well, that, that's what's neat about it. And, and the, the, the stuff that, that we receive or the apps that we receive that we get to review it, is that it, it, there's some extremely uh, innovative and extremely probably complicated to do. I'm not a coder either. So I'm, I'm, I'm coding illiterate, I guess I should say. <laughs> But I, I certainly can appreciate the difficulty that it takes to come up with some of these really innovative ideas. And some are just simple. And, and, and I'm sure the coding's not simple, but the idea seems to be just playing uh, video games or a couple of things that, that we've seen. And, and But I think it, it you want to open up to the interest of the student because you want the student to be able to move forward. If you tell a, a person who loves video games but doesn't code that, hey, if you code, you can write your own video games, then that opens them to a world of coding that, they can play. Uh, we actually have a member of Congress who uh, invented a certain style of video games who, uh, from California. So no telling where it can lead you. And why do you think early intervention in STEM and computer science is so important? Well, whenever you can pick someone's interest, and the earlier the better. Uh, a lot of people get interested in what they want to do when they're, they're young, as we're, uh, this is during Olympic weeks, or a couple of weeks, right? So you're seeing 17, 18, 19 year olds participating at a world class level they've been doing since they were two or three, uh, I'm sure, or if not even from, from almost birth, if their parents are pushing them in that direction or helping them in that direction. So just as earlier you become interested in that, the longer you have the opportunity to become uh, proficient in it. And so I've seen people that are have been in high school when they became interested in it. And now we, we have junior high or middle school, I guess some areas call people participating. And just think what, uh, if you're 12 and 13 and already coding, what are you gonna do when you're 17, 18, 19, or 20? Yeah. And what do you think the long-term benefits of hosting the App Challenge are? A couple of things. One, I think it's important just to highlight everyone. And when I was in high school, um, the people who got highlighted are the ones who scored touchdowns. And being that I wasn't one that scored any touchdowns, uh, you want an opportunity for every child to be successful, every person to be successful in, in their field. And so we do the congressional art uh, competition, the congressional app challenges. It, it's just an opportunity for, for people who are who do things different than um, have the opportunity to be successful and be looked at and be, and be rewarded for it. it. It's, it's, it's fun to me. And I enjoy since I was one of those kids uh, to see, to go to an assembly, to give somebody a military Academy appointment because somebody gets recognized for doing something that my high school, I know it's changed. That was over almost 40 years ago, mm -hmm. but uh, the ones who got the, the recognition are the ones who were really good on the, the football field and, and it's nice to show people get, they get recognition for all kinds of talents. And I, that's what I want to do is make sure people can do whatever they, whatever they feel like they can do and aspire to whatever they want to aspire. 
but I always will say every single person is talented, whether it's running with a football or whether it's from designing an app challenge, making a magnificent piece of art. We have uh, young people with the, that are extremely talented and I want the opportunity for them to be showcased and this is an opportunity for that. That's great. Now, as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, how do you think Congress should address the digital divide, whether it be increasing rural broadband infrastructure or ensuring affordable access in urban centers? Well, thanks for that. We are very focused on it. As a matter of fact, just recently, particularly during the pandemic, uh, we've seen that the digital divide really matters, whether it is uh, young people not going to school and having to learn through via broadband. So you hear stories of parents driving their kids to a McDonald's and get a Wi-Fi uh, connection so they can do their homework. And we don't want that in this country. We also see it in telehealth, uh, where a lot of people were not able to go to the position, but able to do their health care over uh, Zooms and those kinds of things. And so, uh, but people have to have access to it. It's, it, 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 it's fine to make it available. I mean, to make the, the platform available, but if they can't get on the platform, they can't do the homework that way. But we spent a tremendous amount of money just recently getting people up to date on the on the broadband rural infrastructure. The problem is it's such a big country. And yet you, you asked me two questions. One, how do we get into the cities? Well, we do pretty much have the infrastructure in most urban areas. It's getting making it affordable for people. If you have to subsidize, we need to make sure they have access to it. The second one is, I mean, we have a big country and there's broad spaces and getting that last mile, they go from uh, the last mile to the home. We need to look at all kinds of, if it's not fiber, we need to make sure when 5G, the fifth generation comes along, that we have the ability to get the speeds that are necessary for people to, to you know, it's not to this day and age, it's really not just doing homework. It's also if you have ac access to uh, to Netflix and those types of things that, that people, that just make people lives better if they want to watch TV or, or they want to do something educational, you need to have access to the internet. And that's become something that, that we're focused on doing. Now, is there a piece of technology that you can't live without? Well, I, I hate to say it, but I guess it's my iPhone, whether I'm voting in Capitol Hill, going to a meeting and, and texting is just the easier thing to do. A lot of people will call, but you can actually sit in a meeting and not that I would ever sitting in a committee hearing and not listen 100%, but you can answer a lot of questions that people give that to you. I, I'm a fan of the TV show Seinfeld, and there's a couple of episodes, maybe two or three episodes, where the whole thing is the cast missing each other uh, about trying to link up, and they're, they're set to meet at a design time, and for some reason they can't get there, so the whole thing is about near misses. And, and I watch that and say, that wouldn't happen now, because you would just text somebody. I can't get there at this theater, let's meet at a different one. And and so those kinds of things, I guess iPhone is something that, that we've all become accustomed to. And when you're in Washington, if people visit me all the time, and this is a good example of it, and there are lights on every clock and there are different combinations of red lights and white lights to say whether we're in recess, whether we're meeting, whether we're voting or what's going on on Capitol Hill. And that's for the old timers. It's, it is uh, used to, you could look at the clock and say, where do I need to be? by reading the lights. So I asked somebody one day, I said, what does a red dot and two white dots on the clock mean? And a guy says, it means if you know what it, it, if you know what it is, you've been here too long. And the second one is, if you're using a beeper, you've probably been here too long. If you use an iPhone, it's probably just about right. I got to Washington just as the iPhones were coming into being. Um, and I haven't been there that long. So I think we've just got so um, used to it. The one thing that downside of it is we communicate so much back and forth that way. Uh, there are not a lot of records. You can go back and read letters and things for people wrote in the turn. I'm reading a book on J James Monroe and a lot of the books put together by just correspondence that they sent back and forth. And now it's all electronic. And I'm, I'm afraid we're going to lose some of that. Uh, not that my communications would be equivalent to James Monroe's, but <laughs> what about other people? They're gonna, there's a future James Monroe in Congress, I'm sure. And so uh, the question is, are those communications going to be there? Yeah. And my last question for you, what is the latest piece of technology that excites you? Well, I've seen, I don't think how, how it's in use, but, but what I do see is out yet. But I think what is coming is, is medical apps. Uh, I saw a device the other day that's not FDA approved yet, so it's not out, but you can actually blow into it and it will start reading your, intake your oxygen uh it, can, it it they think it can detect 
cancer may be in your body and different things such wow. as that. And so as we get more sophisticated, and one, you could blow into it, tells you if you have a virus and can generate a prescription for you. If, of course, those are not let yet legal. A physician has to write the prescription. But I just saw that recently. And I think what excites me is how we're going to take, like our young people with these apps, how we take the technology that's available and they come up with applications for them that completely revolutionize, uh, you know, primary care. Somebody, you almost can do your own primary care if you have a cold or if you have something simple by just uh, using a device. And that, I think that's exciting as we move forward. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. And for our viewers, the 2021 Congressional App Challenge is live, so you can register and submit your apps between now and November 1st. Thank you. Thank you for having me.